Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being at our next installment of our virtual internship webinar series. My name is Danny Rubin. I'm the founder of our company. We're called Rubin, and we provide online instruction for business communication skills. Teachers, especially if you're new to us, show up your Zoom hands, please. How many students send you emails that look like text messages? Any hands for emails that look like texts? So we help students write professionally, hold conversations to open doors for themselves. And today we're going to do that with some really cool guests. We're grateful for their time, their busy schedules, learning about the world of working in professional sports. And we're going to get to Scott and Richard in just a couple of moments. We're going to do some housekeeping notes first, as we always do. And I also want to introduce Mac Dowd from the Rubin team. She'll be hanging out in the chat, answering any questions you might have. And also Kelly Greer, our sign language interpreter for the day. Thank you, Kelly. So as we jump in, let me first share, as we always do, for those who are new to us, how many are here for the first time? How many teachers are new to us today? Any new teachers joining us today? So we always like to give out free resources right away and mention it again at the end. And we have a revolving mix of free resources. And here's what we wanted to share with you today some lessons on how to handle failure. Teachers, how many of you think your students struggle sometimes with handling failure, handling criticism, and learning how to get up from that moment and, and get better? So we put together a free Google Drive folder of exercises for how to handle failure, like how to respond when you don't land the internship or the job, how to reply when people don't answer your emails. What do you say next? How to ask somebody for feedback, how to tell a story of what time you overcame an obstacle. For a cover letter and how to improve how you look in the eyes of others like for public speaking. So we'd love to give you all of these resources in a Google Drive that you can share with your students and your building. We also always give this out too in our new in our digital age, in our virtual age, an online presentation checklist with some tips on how to prepare for a presentation, how to give the presentation. And it's a great resource to put in the classroom or give out to students a one sheeter with some quick tips. If you're new to our community and you would like these resources, please go to the chat right now, type the word interested and your email address. And like I said, if you're new, this is for the teachers. And if you're new to our community, never used our stuff before, we'd like to do a five minute phone call either tomorrow or the next day. Quickly in the middle of your day, just chat for a minute, learn about your classroom, your program, and then pass along these resources so you can share them with your students and your colleagues. Okay, so we'd love to give this out, but we wanna chat first. We can't do it in this environment, there's too many people. So just put, thank you for those who are putting it, interested in your email, and we will give it out um, starting um, tomorrow. We'll put an invite on your calendar. If it doesn't work for you, then just suggest another time. Okay, and we'll work around your busy day. So thank you to those who have um, put their information and we'll mention it again at the end. Continuing on, we will have we have two more virtual internship sessions this uh, spring semester. The next one's gonna be on the other side of Easter on Wednesday, April 27th, 12.30 Eastern, the world of a lab technician. Anybody here involved in health sciences perhaps or have colleagues who do health sciences, please invite them that day, learning about what it's like to work in a doctor's office or a laboratory as a lab tech. So we're changing gears from today and going into the world of health sciences with a woman who is now a laboratory manager at a hospital system. And finally, a couple last things. Um, everybody here today watching with us live, tomorrow you'll receive an email with the certificate <coughs> for being here, which you can use in your portfolio or up in the classroom showing that you were with us today. And if you're watching this on a recording, you can still have the resources that I mentioned please just go uh, to send us an email to the email in red with that subject line, and we will send you the resources uh, at the, just the same, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pop out of here and I'm going to bring in our special guests. I'm gonna have them quick, in, quickly introduce themselves and they're, you know, you've had long storied careers. So you kind of condense it for just a, you know, a short bit, get us up to today. And we're gonna talk about your careers a little bit um, and then get to the students' questions. So let me turn to Scott first to say hello to the group. Hello, yeah, my name is Scott Zumsteg. I work for the San Francisco Giants and I'm in charge of the ticket finance for the team. It's, it, 
it's a it's one position in our finance department that has about 10 people and uh, we run the entire baseball team minor leagues major leagues wow. uh, uh, all the properties we have baseball's kind of expanded um, in my past I worked for the I worked for the Giants for about nine years now I worked for the A's for nine years before that I worked for Cal football for two or three years before that and then I had a previous career as a stockbroker that I did for a while. And then I decided um, that I wanted to get into sports. I'd worked in sports as a kid. I'd worked at the stadiums um, as my first job from when I was 14 all the way through college. So I, I kind of wanted to go back and, and go full circle on, on my career. Love so it. And we'll, a brief we'll, introduction. That's perfect. And we'll get into what you're doing today as part of that team in just a few minutes. Let me turn to Richard and let him introduce himself. Yeah, um, I mean, I was I started out as a student. I wanted to be in sports, and so um, I got a degree in sports management. And the last thing I needed to do to graduate was get an internship. Um, luckily enough, I was able to get one with the Oakland A's um, in the ticketing department. Um, I was there for three years. Uh, tried to work my way up as best I could, and then the A's bought the rights to the San Jose Earthquakes um, as an expansion team. Um, and it was a great opportunity for me to run my own ticketing department, the ticket operations department. Uh, from there, uh, I worked my way up over the, over 10 years. Um, we built a new uh, soccer-specific stadium in San Jose, uh, was the vice president of stadium operations there. Wow. Um, and there was an opportunity to come out here to Portland. And um, and I'm currently uh, the vice president of uh, event operations here at the Rose Quarter, um, which includes um, our Moda, the Moda Center, which is the building the Blazers play in, along with us, another venue here that's about 8,000 seats um, that the Blazers used to play in. Um, so, wow, you have a lot going on um, in your world day to day, not just in basketball season, but year round, right? It never stops for you. There is no yep. off season for you. So, um, before we uh, kind of get into the you know nitty gritty of your days, I want to share my screen and show you because we talk about this a lot with the students who join us. That we talk a lot about doing our research, doing our homework before we meet somebody new to show that we've taken interest in other people and we're not just there for ourselves, right? It's not just, what can you do for me? It's, I want to get to know you and build a relationship. So I was on your LinkedIn and learning about your background and different professional teams you've worked for. And I also went to the sites for your teams and I wanted to show, let's start with the Giants, start with Scott, okay? Mm -hmm. So I was on the Giants news section, which is where I encourage all students to spend time on a company's website before you meet with the company. And this is not your world, Scott, but I wanted to ask you because it's so interesting to me that there's a whole story about the American players taking Spanish classes so they can learn to talk with their Spanish teammates, which I find really interesting because there's so many Latin players in baseball today. And so now they're trying to bridge that cultural uh, gap by learning how to speak to each other. I, don't, I know that's not your day to day, but I just wanted your quick sound off on the article that I read. No, it's a tremendous idea uh, um, to actually, I mean, I think a lot of that goes on in clubhouses anyway, just with the immersion of all these different cultures. Yeah. Um, I will say one of the things that happened at the Giants in the past three years is we brought in Farhan Zaidi as our GM three years ago, or this is his fourth season. Um, he's very forward thinking. We've done a lot of interesting stuff over here. You know, we were the first team to have a woman coach on the field. Uh, we were, we were a very we surprised a lot of people a few years ago by hiring like 13 assistant coaches for a team of 26 players. <laughs> so there's a lot of new stuff. It, th this doesn't surprise me because we're doing a lot of things that teams have never done before to get outside the box and really just try to be the best organization we can on the field and, and professionally. Really smart. And, and for the teachers out there, take a look. Classes are taught by Jen Bath, a former high school Spanish teacher. Now she's teaching Spanish to American professional baseball players for the Giants. So, you know, you never know where those skills can translate to. And then let me go over to Richard. I was on the Blazers website looking around at the diversity, and equity and inclusion efforts, which is very popular in schools today. A big, a big item that runs through a lot of school divisions and something our company talks about, too. How does the diversity, equity, inclusion components factor into the work that you're doing in event management? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's every part of our business. Um, this is such a, it's, it's one of our pillars of our organization that from our president, our owner um, down really truly believes in, and we want to be a leader in it. Um, and so 
you know, that that goes towards, you know, we're trying to bring all sorts of different diverse um, events here to the to the Moda Center and into the Rose Quarter. Um, so that means concerts, that means festivals, um, all kinds of different fairs. Um, just we want everybody to be a part of Rip City. That's one of our slogans. Um, Rip City is kind of a, a synonymous with Portland. Um, and, you know, that just permeates throughout. And, you know, the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, you know, we we want you know, from a hiring standpoint, you know, like we have somebody from our inclusion uh, board that's on each interview, um, making sure that we're asking questions to, to make sure that they're the right fit for us organizationally, um, that everybody that we hire is open-minded, that is, you know, inclusive, and, you know, really, you know, we want the best of the best, and, you know, to, to have the, the melding of minds, you need to have a diverse, um, a diverse team. Yeah. Uh, it's extremely important for us throughout every aspect of the organization. That's that's a great answer. And and by the way, students, for the worksheet, Max, throw the worksheet out one more time, please. The worksheet that we gave out, we have a question about some of the, the, the advice that our guests are providing. And one of those, he just said, you know, you want to have a diverse team to do great work. And that's important to him. Now, let me ask the question to um, Richard first. If, if, imagine if I'm coming in to interview under you for your team. And I came in already asking you questions about DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. I'm asking questions about your background, about projects. What would that say to you that I came in with my own questions about what's going on as opposed to just answering your questions? Now, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the most important questions that we have is, you know, like how we pretty much structure our organization. You know, there's a lot of questions that we ask the interviewee. But the last question that we always ask is, what questions do you have for us? Right. And that question right there tells me, as you mentioned, a lot about the individual. Um, how much, like you said, how much research have they done? Have they actually thought about if it's the right fit for them um, organizationally? Like what sort of things are they as a you know employee that they really have to offer? Is it the right, is it the right fit? Um, you know, and so them asking questions that, you know, like either about diversity, equity, inclusion, and what does that really mean? Because obviously that's a buzzword right yeah, now. Yeah. Everybody, you know, is talking about, but what does it mean? And, and what, you know, have me explain it to you and make sure that that makes sense to you. And it's not just a phony, like, we're just saying we do this. Right. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, like we want, I mean, if you can tie in like the, the points on the job description and, and turn those, um, you know, you need to have, um, experience in Microsoft Excel and turning that into a question of like, you know, I'm curious, like what, how in depth are you, are, are, are am I going to be working with Excel, you know, like from a formula standpoint and from, um, yes. you know, from like asking those questions of, of, of digging into it, that shows that you're, you care and that you really want to know what you're going to be doing. And then you can also ideally show off your skills in those areas and say, oh, that's great. You know, I, I actually am, you know, I've taken two years of that, that and I've, have done numerous projects in there. So I feel like it could be a great fit. Um, so great. yeah, absolutely. It, it's a critical no, that, question. Thank, thank you. I really want students to hear that the power of research. Scott, what would you say, you know, if I came in and I'm asking you questions about that um, Spanish immersion classes, just not even related to your job day to day, but just showing that I was on the site, I'm interested, I'm reading, I'm absorbing. What would that say to you? Even if I'm in high school trying to intern, what would that say to you uh, for me as an applicant? Well, I it Anytime you've done your research or just have enthusiasm for the job you're applying for, it makes a big difference. Um, the sports, the sports career, as Richard can tell you too, is there's a lot of weird hours. There's a lot of weird requests. Um, you have to be hundred percent bought into it and you have to understand what you're getting into. Um, it's not something you can just go down and get at the job store, <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> like my 16 year old always asks about is where's the job store. So, <laughs> Yeah, you want to you want to have people that are engaged and want to be there, and are, and, and that comes with asking the right questions and being curious. Great. Um, Great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, so any question they ask that, that that refers to the organization, you know, I'm in finance and accounting, so it's a little dry sometimes. Right. right. But um, but yeah, just any enthusiasm they're showing or anything right. that they're showing that they've done some research. Now, I think Richard will also tell you too that. The best applicant, not is always the person that comes in and says, I'm a really big fan. <laughs> so correct, correct. You don't, you don't necessarily want to be that person. Ooh, that's good advice. Everybody write that down. Don't don't say that. They don't want to hear it. Keep going, Scott. It helps, but it'll usually show through in the interview. Um, so yeah, I just think just in any job interview, whether it's sports or anything, just 
you know, it's a 50, 50 thing. You need to bring 50%. The, the person asking the questions needs to bring 50%. You need to meet in the middle. Love that. Um, I love that. With your enthusiasm. I want to get into sort of your, each of your, it's like a day in the life. As I do that, students and teachers, please start to put your own questions in the Q&A along the bottom of the screen. Start putting your questions in the Q&A and we'll pull them as we go. Okay, so that's my invitation to you to ask. Let me start with Scott. Scott, take us through a day, and this probably is a very busy time, you know, right before the season. So take us through what you're doing with you and your team in your role. Uh, currently, right now, I am in, in the position of um, just getting ready to see what a new season looks like uh, for the for finances. Um, every year, things seem to change. We have a new collective bargaining agreement this year, so I'm not even sure what's entitled and all the, the, the changes that have happened because we haven't seen them all yet. Um, it, it, it's just, yeah, it's a very busy time. It's very dynamic. Um, just just so trying to kind of see where we are. Take us into ticketing like for the average fan they want to go buy a ticket um why are certain tickets priced the way they are do ticket prices fluctuate game to game um depending on where you're sitting like what does the average fan not know or think about um when they're you know just going up to the box office or going online to buy a ticket like what's happening in the background um they uh so yeah, ticketing is, is dynamically priced now. So there's various games will be more expensive than others. Um, we're always trying to evaluate what's going to kind of be the right matrix to put together the current grid on all that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's is it, is it like an algorithm? Is it like a computer program that's determining pricing based on certain we, variables? Yeah, we do use something. We do use some of that, and then there's also just sort of some common sense of looking at your games and when they are. Uh, San Francisco, the, the Giants are sort of in a unique situation. We're in a, a city right now that's that's kind of been hollowed out by the pandemic. Mm. So we've run into a real weird situation where we do real well on the weekends and there's virtually nobody in the city to go to the ballpark on the weekdays. Wow. So we've had to do a lot of pricing adjustments and a lot of adjustments on, you know, kind of just, we're constantly having to just evaluate our the dynamics of our of our market right now and it's been so very the stadium is full on a saturday afternoon but yes. on a tuesday it's quiet exactly wow yeah, yeah. i mean wow. we can we can have forty thousand on the weekend and we can have fifteen thousand on a tuesday wow um, wow so we're trying to deal with that real creative with pricing and promotion um uh, wow fascinating let me go to richard to take us through your day like what are you doing right now you know as you're wrapping up the nba season and heading into more events or maybe it's simultaneous what does it look like for you? Yeah, I mean, my world is all about the, you know, making sure the event um, is amazing for the, the fans. Like we want every experience for the guests, um, be it at a basketball game or a concert to, to be just, you know, an extraordinary, we're trying to create extraordinary moments. So look, you know, I oversee, you know, the first thing I ever see is uh, parking, traffic and parking. So making sure that, you know, everybody is flowing into the parking lot and not, you know, that's not taking forever. And there's not a lot of friction points um, for you to enter from there. It's looking at our ingress or our, the lines, the gates. Um, so, you know, we obviously, you know, just how we're kind of, um, how the building is built. We only have two main entrances. Um, and so, you know, we try to have as many um, ticket takers and um, metal detectors there as we possibly can fit. Um, but, you know, we have staffing concerns. So like, it's been really tough getting a lot of part-time staff. I mean, we, we, it takes a lot of people. I mean, in a perfect world, we would have 200 guest experience people. So that's like ticket takers, ushers, um, you know, like directional people, helping people to get to their seats. Right now, I mean, we're probably at, you know, two thirds of that. Um, and we still have a big gap in, in, in getting that to, to where it needs to be. So it's kind of juggling um, just people around and, and moving pieces so that, you know, hopefully the fan doesn't know. Hopefully it's a really easy ingress, um, them getting into the building. And then from there, like making sure our uh, concession stands and the flow of the concourse, um, that people are able to move around and find their food and the signage is, is, is um, all, you know, easily accessible and, and they can see it. And, and from that point standpoint, um, we have, I also oversee security. Um, so that's the people obviously entering the building and checking to make sure it, you right. Know, anything in but then also i don't know if anybody has seen or saw like the video a few days ago what happened in houston where there was like um i wouldn't say he's a full streaker 
but he was, you know, pretty scantily clad and he, he made his way to the court. Um, and then they ended up, you know, grabbing him and taking him away. Like that's something that we want to make sure doesn't happen. So like, you know, working with our security team to make sure that they have, um, you know, they, the training and, and their position in the correct spots to prevent somebody from getting out of the court. Um, because that's one of the biggest things that, you know, it always, there's a pit in my stomach if there's a court intruder and they actually get on the court and close to the players um, from a security standpoint, that that's what you always dread. Um, right, so right. There, just making sure that, you know, guests are, ha you know, interacting with our ushers and they're, you know, ideally like taking pictures or, or helping them kind of either get to their seat or the right location and, and having that just great, as good of ex experience as possible. And then obviously exiting out, um, you know, and, and again, making sure that they flow out and traffic wise and everything kind of goes as smoothly as possible there wow. as well. So. It's, you know, all the things that we as fans don't think about that are going into an event and that you're like only thinking about, you know, all. And and if we're not thinking about it, then it's probably working great. Right. We're yeah. just getting to our seat. We're getting out of there. We're going home. And it's like you don't think about these things until it becomes a problem. I want to go back. Uh, I want to ask the students. We talk a lot in our sessions about the power of numbers, using numbers, our own numbers, being specific. Scott said that on a Saturday they could get 40,000 people. And on a Tuesday they might get how many? How many people might come on a Tuesday versus 40,000 on the weekend? Can someone, thank you very much, Kristen, 15,000. That's very important. And also Richard said the ideal number of employees like working the, uh, the arena is how many? How many people will be the ideal number? And they're only a two thirds of that. Thank you. Look at that. Aren't they paying attention? They're sitting right there listening on every word. So we have some good questions coming in now from, but please continue to put your questions in the Q&A, not the chat, because it gets lost in the chat. Okay. We have several questions from uh, the Paul B. Moore sports marketing class. We'll start. I'll, I'll pick one up here. How do you know if a promotion is successful? Maybe I'll start with Scott on that. Like you try <laughs> something out to get people in on a Tuesday is the only way to know, but by, you know, people sitting in the seats, is that the only true measure? It's actually interesting. It's something we, we have a lot of promotions at the giants. We have 81 home dates and we probably have something going on 40 of those dates. And we've actually sort of been in a process of evaluating in the last couple of years of, you know, if the promotion is really adding value to our attendance or not. Um, okay. So it, it, it's not, a, it's not a metric that's easy to figure out. And then internally you'll have, you'll have uh, different factions that are fighting for their opinion on that. So it, it, you, it, there are numbers you can, you know, you try to use numbers that you have on attendance versus other nights and comps where you don't have something going on. Um, but I would say is it, it, at the end of the day, our organization just tries to have a bazillion events to always have something drawing out the person to the ballpark besides just the game. Right. Like first 10,000, get a t-shirt, a bobblehead, you know, there's always something to try and get people in the gate. Yeah, it's even got more complicated than that now. I mean, you're, I know you're in a minor league city, but in the pros, a lot of times we'll, for an extra five bucks, you'll get a, a specialized doll that will make, you know, 5,000 mm. of or a t shirt or a hat okay. or something. So it, it's not just like kind of like the minor league baseball model where there's just something you get when you get in the gate. Like you can almost put together a package of things you're getting. Like we had a Harry Potter theme night last year where you could get three different shirts. You could, you could buy all three for 30 bucks. You could get, you could get one of them for 10 bucks, but we got pretty creative with that one. In fact, so creative that we had a hard time uh, delivering on that one. So we, we had to rethink that one. <laughs> you, you over, you over promised a little bit. Cause you, you also well, don't no, know the you reaction. Know what, we did, what we did and Richard will understand this. We understaffed. So we had a situation where we had people that wanted all three shirts, but it took them about seven innings to get all of them. So this is the kind of nightmare that Richard knows about. Um, and we worked through it. The fans, we, you know, we dealt with it as gracefully as we could. Because right, if you're always trying new things, yeah. you really don't know what's going to happen. You know, maybe it's based on past history, but you don't always know like what's, no, exactly. what might happen on that given night, that new promotion. Right. Yeah. Um, so let me hop over to Richard. I'm going to go through. We have a lot of good questions now. Linda Mullick wall asks, what classes did you take in high school or college, I'll extend it, that help you in your job? You know, the students are watching and they might love to be in your organization or in a similar group. What should they be learning in school or groups they should be a part of? 
What would you say? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I took, I mean, I actually majored in sports management. Um, so a lot of it was business focused. Um, so, I mean, there's, my world is a lot, I mean, it, it's still basic business premise. Um, so, I mean, Excel is great. I mean, I, I think that I use Excel uh, almost every single day. Um, I mean, I think there was different, I mean, I took some sociology classes too. I mean, I think in, in regards to just, mm. we have so many full, I, I oversee a lot of full-time and part-time people. Um, and so like having that, having the ability to, you know, interact with everybody. Um, I took some public speaking classes that were also helpful. Mm. You know, I ended up, you know, having to speak in front of large, a large number of staff members in particular. Um, so just feeling comfortable in, in those ways. Um, I mean, I feel like for me, my thing was, uh, you know, the school that I went to, they very much volunteered at a number, like we were able to volunteer at a number of different events. Um, we were able to do a lot of stadium tours or arena tours. Um, you know, people are very uh, open in this industry to, to allow, you know, like to, to be as helpful as they can. It, it's really hard to get into um, because there's so many, like there's so many people that are, want to get into it. Um, you know, I think that as Scott will attest to is, um, you know, it's not all glamour and glitz. And that's why when Scott mentioned, you know, people um, saying like, oh, I'm just the biggest fan of the Blazers. I just, you know, I, I just would love to work for them. Like that can be a little bit of a turnoff because uh, like for us, we know that the majority of the time, you know, you just got to get your hands dirty and you got to work hard, put your head down. And, um, you know, just, you know, the, what's going to set you apart is your work ethic. Mm. Um, in your willingness to, you know, put your hand up and volunteer for it for anything and say, Hey, I, I can help you there. Or, um, you know, obviously the first thing is making sure that the tasks that you're assigned, you do a really good job of. Um, but to me, the differentiators is always the people like once that job is complete and they feel confident that they did a good job, them asking like, how else can I help? You know, what else is available for me to do? Like, you know, I'm ready to do whatever you need me to do. I'm, I'm a team player. Um, so to me, that that's really what has always you know, I've always, I think I've been very lucky in my job. Like I've hired good people. Um, I've worked with them to make sure that they felt comfortable in the role. And then once I, I feel confident that they can do their job, I raise my hand um, no matter what it is. And I'm like, oh, merchandise. Sure. I, I can, I can, I'm interested in that. And same, same basic premise. I, I, I'm interested in kind of take, you know, like, you know, what can I do to help? Um, so I that, love that my advice. I love that. How many students think that they could just jump in and do whatever's asked, finish one task and just say, what else can I do? Because that's what that's what Richard would want to hear. And I, do you have Richard, do you have I mean, both of you um, interns? Um, are they always in college? Are they younger than that? Um, who, who are the young people kind of running around your offices? I'll go to Scott first. Scott. Who, yeah, per personally, I don't have an intern for myself. And my finance is all full time people, but we have but I actually work inside the ticket office. So yes, we have a lot of different interns. A lot of them kind of are usually in college programs and they're doing it during the summer. Um, and yeah, they work really, they work hard and they get, they get great experience. Um, and, and, you know, the, the thing is that, that they become just as valuable as part of the equation during a season. And I think Richard can attest to this as, as the paid employees, because, you know, it's, Definitely in sports, there's a team and a hierarchy where you're only as good as the, your weakest link. Mm -hmm. So your interns, a lot of times, will be doing pretty important things. And so you need them to be good. And they typically, they want to be good. They're trying to, to do a great job and, and, and make a good impression. I mean, the other one thing about sports is, I, I, I don't know how to put a number on it, but I would say, 90% of the people that end up working in an organization were an intern there at some point. Wow. Yeah, it's really, really high. But it's very, very logical. Just think about in your life, like when you're trying to look for someone reliable and someone who can do the job, you're going to go to people you've already met and you've right. already seen do it. Right. So you're going to have such a leg up if you've done an internship in a, in a sports team to go back to that sports team. There'll probably be people there that, that already knew you. And logically, if you did a good job and they feel comfortable with you, they're going to want you there. Right. Versus right. trying to find something off a resume or something. Right. Off. Right. There's already that connection. And, and I want to give credit, uh, Amanda Fletcher. Thank you. She asked this general question of like, how do you get started? Let me ask Richard, if a student's watching this and they're living in, we've seen the cities that we're in, right? Charlotte, Kansas City, we're all over the country and they want to get an internship this summer. 
uh, high school or maybe or college, they want to get started, want to get their foot in the door. How do they do that? Do they have to formally apply? Do they can they walk in and ask? Do they have to what what is the process, at least for the Blazers? Uh, for the Blazers, there is a formal applica application. It is with college students. Um, I mean, we have ours run throughout the season. Um, and so I think the application process actually starts in the next month or so. Um, okay. So our website um, you can go to and you can apply for, I mean, we, we have a ton of it. I mean, we probably have like 15 interns um, from marketing to event management to, um, you know, social media to, I mean, there's, there's a, just a, a myriad of different internships there. Um, but yeah, you would apply. Um, and then, you know, there's, you know, we do get a good number of applicants. Um, and from there, yeah, there's, you go through a normal interview. I mean, you're doing a panel, you're doing like a panel interview, you're doing some follow-ups um, to make sure that it's the right fit for us. Um, you know, we pay, you know, it's, it's a little more, it's a little more than minimum wage, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity. I mean, I think for, we also have opportunities in our um, guest experience department. I mean, we hire 16 year olds and up. Um, it's, one of the, there's a couple um, departments where we're allowed to hire 16 year olds. Um, right. And that to me is just an awesome opportunity. I mean, you, you get a chance to um, work, you know, work and experience what, you know, it's like to, to you know, be in an arena and to, um, you know, look at the other side, you know, like you were saying, like, you don't realize all that goes into the, to putting on an event. Um, if you're able to, uh, you know, depending on where you live and the either minor league baseball or, or sorry, minor league sports team or major league, like a lot of them you can apply as a 16 year old. And right now is a, there's, you know, talking to my colleagues throughout the country, um, hiring part-time staff has, has become more and more difficult. Um, so I think that there's a lot of great opportunities there. And ideally you, you know, work hard, you, you know, show that you're a really hard worker and that you're paying attention and that you want to take on more responsibility. And then, you know, if there's an opportunity with an internship, like Scott mentioned, um, you know, the work ethic has all, to me, like when I've hired throughout, you know, the many years I've been doing this, work ethic is the most difficult trait that you can find. Mm. In an interview, it's almost impossible to, to understand fully what it is because every single person will tell you they're the hardest worker and they <laughs> you know, do whatever they need to, to do to, to get the job done. But in reality, um, it's not the case. There's a lot, you know, like, it's really, it's one of those tough ones. So if you have somebody that can, that you trust that can vouch for the person that, or you've seen it with your own two eyes, as Scott mentioned, like that's going to be the differentiator between you and maybe somebody that has a better resume or, you know, has yep. more experience. Like to me, like, especially for entry-level positions, give me a hard worker that is willing to learn a hundred percent of the time. I'd rather take that than, you know, somebody that was a valedictorian or, you know I mean? Like wow. just had much no, I know what you're saying. And we, we talk about it in here a lot. I mean, we've talked in previous webinars about uh, telling stories of ourselves, Richard, in the interview. Like, give me, don't tell me you're hardworking. Give me an example. And then I'm yeah. really going to understand who, who you are. Um, I want to go back to Scott. And um, I think it would be, you know, it was something that Richard said that prompted me. And we talk a lot in here, too, about the importance of follow-up questions, right? I don't just come in with a list of questions. I'm just checking them off. I am going with the flow of the conversation, right? And for students, that's important to understand. This is how you talk to people is you just let you react to what they say. You don't just have this standard protocol. So I want to know, and I'll ask it to Scott, you know, in, in the average baseball game, a Tuesday, a Saturday, whatever it is, what is happening behind the scenes, at least for the Giants? Like what's going on behind the walls that the average fan has no idea is happening? But from the staff's perspective, like how what is going and taking place? Uh, I, th I think so many people don't realize how many people it takes to put on a baseball game. I mean, we have probably 3000 people working in there between oh. security guards, the concessions business itself is a massive business. Um, so there's a lot going on and um, that the, that, that people don't know about. Uh, I, I'm trying to think if there's any, I mean, if you just uh, one of the ones that's kind of fun is just being up in the uh, video operations room. Yeah. Like just to run a scoreboard. There. There's about nine different people. There's literally a television producer up there to run. I that. would imagine it's like putting on a production every game. It is putting on a production. They run off scripts. They have binders. They, they come in hours early. Like they'll come in for a night game at 10 in the morning to be making video clips for that night's game. They're wow. making advertisements for future games. It's really, um, that's probably one of the ones that's kind of the most interesting behind the scenes. Um, you know, it, 
But then, you know, even in the clubhouse in a baseball game, you have trainers working back there on players. You have coaches on video <laughs> telling players um, what, you know, helping them with their batting. There's it's so it, the question you asked is there's that that behind the scenes thing is going on like with 30 different things in the ballpark that right, are all right. equally important. Securities, there's a, secu- a security command center that's got a video screen with 300 videos going that they're monitoring what's going on in the ballpark. So yeah, there's a lot of cool things you can kind of walk around on oh. a ballpark tour and see, and you just have no idea. I love that what's going on. And I, you know, students tell me how many people did he say are working for an average baseball game? What was that number? Tell me again. Let's, let's stay with me. We're rounding towards home. No pun intended. Actually, that's a complete pun intended. We're heading towards home. A few more minutes here. 3,000 people. Richard, would you add anything to that? What's going on at a Blazers game that fans don't know or would never think about? I mean, yeah, I think Scott kind of touched on it. I mean, you have all these different departments that are all kind of working and focused on their, their area of expertise. I mean, I, I think, as Scott mentioned, I mean, like, we have probably about 1,000 uh, concession workers And each of those different stands, trying to make sure you don't run out of food, trying to make sure that, um, you know, the people that you, you know, some of these people get are part of um, community groups that get paid, you know, again, because of staffing shortages, you have these nonprofit groups that come in just for a game to run concession stands. And, you know, you're teaching them as you're kind of going and um, and then, you know, from there, like the stand itself has to run like a, like a normal restaurant or a business. And so it, each of those individual units, um, you know, is pretty fascinating if you take them, you know, one by wow. one. Um, yeah, I would say like, that's a big piece. Um, I mean, just getting ready. I mean, we have a conversion team, you know, like I mentioned, we, we do events and so we'll do a concert one night and then we'll switch everything over to a basketball set. And that's literally people, you know, starting once that concert ends at, you know, last night, for example, we had uh, Tyler, the creator, you know, that ended at 1230 at night. Um, They have 30 trucks that, you know, they're taking the sets down, they're bringing everything into the trucks. Then we have our team that comes in and converts the building, all this, you know, we, we take seats out for concerts, we have to put them back in, we have to build the basketball floor, get everything aligned perfectly so that the hoops are, you know, like, literally perfect so when Damian Lillard shoots his three-pointer like he'll know if it's off just a tiny bit and then we'll have to adjust it and stuff so um, all those different elements there um, of, of a conversion um, to, from a, a concert to to basketball like you would never think of but I mean they're working until you know eight in the morning for um, shoot around like the visiting team will come in at 9 a.m uh, wow. and do like a walkthrough and stuff and and so, like, there's so much going on, as Scott mentioned, um, just from all the different departments to, to put on an event. Wow. Just 24-7 in that building. You know, we, we come and we go, and there's just people coming in as we're leaving, and they're there to clean, and they're to set up. And wow. Yep. It's, it's incredible. Um, we're going to take a – stay with us, Scott and Richard. Don't leave. We're going to do – I'm going to do a quick reminder of the notes I said at the beginning, and I'll have a final question for our guests. So for the teachers who came in just after we started, if you missed it, we put together a Google Drive folder for free of exercises for handling failure. You can see the themes down the right side there. We'd love to give it to you to share with your students, share with your school, helping students to handle tough moments. Uh, When things don't go their way, how do you rise up and learn from it? So please, um, I'll tell you how to get that in just a second, as well as an online presentation checklist for giving presentations, how to go in front of Zoom, in front of Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, and land that presentation and make an impact on the audience on the other side of the screen. Um, If you'd like these resources, don't have them yet, please go to our chat right now, type the word interested and your email address. Interested in your email address. And for those who are new to our community, we like to do a five minute phone call somewhere in your day tomorrow to say hello and help you uh, make sense of these resources for your specific program. So if you didn't ask for it yet, please do so now. We will send you an invite for your calendar. If the time doesn't work, just suggest another time, and we will adjust on your schedule. So thank you to those who requested it. Uh, Also, on April 27th, we will be talking to a lab technician about the world of being a lab tech in a hospital setting in this case. So please join us. You'll see some emails about that. This will be after the Easter break, so a few weeks from now. And also, everyone today will get a certificate for being here, which you, the teacher, you can write the student's name right there on uh, the, the, the blank space. You can customize it for the student. 
And finally, if you're watching on a recording, we know many teachers watch on recording, you can have these same failure related resources, email us at the email in red and use that subject line and we will send you the resources that way. Um, I wanna come back to our guest. We had an interesting question that came through right as I was going through that, said, what if I live in an area without a sports team? What opportunities are there for me? What would you suggest, I mean, a tricky question, a curveball, I suppose. So I'll send it to Scott. What would you say to a student where there isn't like an in-person sporting opportunity? Absolutely. Um, so as we were talking about in the last question, there are a lot of different silos all going on in the ballpark or the arena at the same time. They're, and, and they're really all very different businesses. So if you live in a small town, may, maybe you have a movie theater, maybe you have a, mm. a theater, um, some kind of entertainment venue, maybe you work in food services. It's, it's, almost all towns will have things like that. You know, the bottom line is when you're, when you're in high school or in, in that age, you know, 16 and up, 14 and up, wherever you can start getting a job, I think the most important thing you can do is get a job have mm. a job, have something to do. And, and, and in your community, you can always, you always want to start with the question of, well, what do I like to do? And in every community, there's going to be a different answer for all the, the, the kids. And, and then just try to ingratiate yourself in what that is. And then this is where you get to the point that Richard and I were talking about where, so find that first thing. It may not be sports, but maybe it's something that resembles entertainment. Go and do a great job at it. View yourself as maybe, hey, maybe those Maybe those two or three years in high school before I get to go to a bigger college or get to move to a bigger city, um, I can just I can just build up cachet and, and and build up a resume and just work on my work ethic. So there's you can always be doing something, and I think you always should be doing something. I started working at the ballpark. No, I was lucky enough I was in a big city, but I started working at the ballpark when I was. I think the look the laws are different, but when I was a freshman in high school. I sold sodas at Candlestick Park. I made about 10 bucks a day. But to me, that was amazing because my whole idea was, how can I get paid to go work at the stadium as opposed right. to paying to go to the stadium? Right. This is like, that was what I was thinking about in eighth grade. So it's just sort of that mindset of just get involved in something that you love. Great answer. And it'll, it'll, it'll wind its way back eventually to sports. I, I love that. You know, you don't have to think about it as sports. It could be the local movie theater. It just, just working in you know, entertainment and just working at all. Um, I think that's an excellent answer. Richard, I'll give you the final word. So just broad advice. You have students who are like, wow, you know, I'd love to be where you are. Uh, what would be your parting shot, as they say? Yeah, I mean, I think that everybody has different paths. Um, everybody kind of takes different ways to get there. Um, I think that, you know, for me, I, I was able to get the internship and, and that kind of launched my career. I mean, that took me I don't want to say bugging, but um, me reaching out to somebody within the A's that happened to be speaking um, at a conference I was at. And, you know, I really just kind of like kept asking him, like, what can I do? Like, you know, this, you know, I'm very interested in this, this position. Like I was trying to stand out. I think I offered to buy, you know, the cheapest possible season tickets, you know, just if I didn't do a good job, I would buy the cheapest season tickets I could, you know, like that you have because I had no money, um, you know, just to kind of like say, like, I, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Mm. And I'm willing to work hard and I'm going to prove it to you. And obviously I won't have to buy those season tickets, um, but <laughs> stand out in that way. Um, how, you know, like, and I think that, you know, LinkedIn has offered a great opportunity to, you know, reach you know, questions and um, do informational interviews. Like people love like sharing and helping. Um, so if you have questions, I mean, building, building connections, seeing if there's opportunities. Um, yeah. To me, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can we have some show of hands as some virtual applause for our guests today? They are super busy working at the highest levels in sports, and we are so grateful for their time. Great advice all throughout. Really, really cool uh, information and just great. The, the worlds that you're operating in are, are just really what well, we're all watching, you know, on TV. We're watching these games and you're the ones powering them. So we appreciate you very much. I want to thank everybody for being here with us today. Thank you to Ms. Kelly Greer for her efforts with sign language. We hope that you will join us on April 27th for our lab technician conversation. Until then, let's watch some baseball, right? Let's watch some NBA. 
Yep. Uh, we'll kick off the baseball season very soon. And, um, and that's, you know, spring has arrived when baseball's back. So uh, thank you, Scott and Richard, and um, hope everybody has a great rest of the day and a great week. We'll see you soon.